Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Father, our words are so inadequate, God, just to try to describe you. Describe the relationship that you have with us, Father. But God, this morning, thank you for allowing us to come to your throne. Thank you for allowing us to be in your presence this morning, God. God, just thank you for the time of worship and praise this morning. Now, God, as we go into your word, take your word, Father, and let it not fall to the ground, God, but let it be stored in our hearts, God. That is, we are called to a place here, a temporary place, God. Let us never forget that we're here as your workmen. That, God, we're here to carry out your will. And God, we're here to bring you honor and glory through our lives so others may see you. Now, Father, I thank you again for this time to spend in your house to honor you. And we ask all this in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, praise and worship team. A call to build. Somebody's thinking, why? We've got plenty of room. That's something I get to do every day is my job being in construction work. I get to see, I can take a set of plans and pretty much tell what something's going to look like before it becomes a reality. And that enables me to walk people through and say, have you thought about this or this? Is this going to be a problem or is this going to cause an issue? And you know, God is like that. He can look at us and knows what his plan is and what he has for us just by looking at us. And this morning as we look at this in Haggai, and don't ask me how I got over here, God put me over here. I had no idea I was going to be in this book. And haven't really studied this part until this week. And we're going to do a little history this morning too. I want to give you a little bit of background, and I, I told Noah in advance, I said, you're not going to have a lot of the scripture I'm going to use this morning because... I got some of this late last night. But there was a time during King Cyrus of Persia, he permitted 50,000 exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem. And when they came back, during the second year of the return, the foundation of the temple was laid. But opposition came. Opposition came, and let me tell you something this morning. God has laid the foundation of Jesus Christ for the church, but opposition will come. Sadly, there are people who do not want what God has to prevail and to carry on and to reach people. So opposition comes through Satan himself. Now as we look here in their back, it says they joined together with those working on the house of God. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, I'm in Ezra now, chapter 3, if you want to go there, reading in verse 10. It said, the priests and their vestments and the trumpets and the Levites and the Symbols took their places by to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel, 
with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. And it says, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So the foundation's laid. Then what happens in chapter 4 says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Elderon king who brought us here. Now listen to what's said. But the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Now they laid the foundation... They were getting ready to build the temple. And then the Samaritans came and said, we want to join in with you. There's times people will be coming into the church and into your lives that don't belong. The Samaritans were not coming with a true heart to join in and build something to glorify God. They were there for opposition. And they knew that if they could come into the ranks, they could cause opposition. Let me tell you something. Satan has no other plan than to glorify himself by coming into the church and causing opposition. Amen. Now, don't, don't, don't get your minds wondering what's going on. Nothing's going on. I'm making statements this morning and pre-warning you just like Christ pre-warned the disciples. He said, once I'm gone, there's going to be opposition against you. What I'm telling you this morning is, it's not a time of discouragement. It's a time of rejoicing because you're doing something worthwhile. Opposition will come. Amen. 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 So they came and offered, and, but the people with their discernment, the leaders said, no, you cannot have a part in building this temple because... We have been commanded by God himself to build this. What they were saying was, if God wants you included in this, he would have told us. They were using their discernment. So then, the Samaritans decided, okay, if we're not going to get to be a part of this, we'll just see what we can do against y'all. See, that's the way the world works. If they can't come through the front door, they're going to come through the back door. They said, we'll go and offer our help so we can get in there and we can start causing conflict. But the leaders of Israel had enough sense about them to realize this is not of God, so we don't want any part of it. We don't want any part of you. So what they do next is, it says, at the beginning of the reign of King uh, Exodus, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judea and Jerusalem. And I'm not going to read all this, but they went in there and told the king that if you allow this to happen, you allow them to build this, they won't pay you any taxes. They'll be a rebellious people to go and study the history of this people and see. And what they didn't say was when they rebelled, it was usually a rebellion against the things that were ungodly. But the stage is set. They have come in and laid the foundation. And now we're going to look in Haggai, what is said here, starting in verse 2. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Now, the foundation was laid. Now we're looking years down the road. And the people are still saying, we can't build a house. Because, see, through the accusations that had been made, the king sent word to them, you cannot build on this foundation that you've laid. 
Now, rather than going ahead and doing what God had told them to do, they listened to man and did not start building. So in verse 3, it says, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. And verse 4 says, It is a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. Now, the people hadn't continued with the temple, but it hadn't bothered them building their own houses. Here they were building their houses. They were using panels of cedar wood in it. They were adorning their houses and making them look good. And a foundation is laying out there. Now, I still remember as a boy, there was a family that lived over beside us and lived in a little, about a three, three room house. And they had put a foundation in over to build another house, but the house never materialized. Why? I don't know. But that foundation was there. I wonder when these people walked by and they looked and they seen the foundation, if it gave any thought to them, if it cut in their heart. We don't have a temple built yet. But it didn't bother them when they were living in their fine houses. Now let me tell you this. It's time the church quits living on what used to be and the church starts living on what God wants it to be and start building off of what God has for us to build off of. I was talking to Stacy last week and she made a comment. You know what? We could have bring a friend Sunday. We could have, you know, we could double our congregation by everybody bringing one person. You thought about that? But maybe we're content living in our paneled houses. Now I told you don't get ill at me this morning, okay? Just love me. Because I'm the guiltiest person here. Sometimes we get content with just coming to church. And I'm going to tell you something. The last few Sundays... I haven't enjoyed because there wasn't any praise and worship. Now don't get me wrong. Y'all had to tolerate a little bit more preaching. But there's just something about going into God's presence with that praise and worship. It sets the tone for the service. It prepares us to come into His presence. Sometimes you don't realize what you miss until you don't have it. What if we came in next Sunday and this facility was gone? When I was in Talladega, when God released me and told me it was time to leave, I got up on that Sunday morning and told the congregation, I had a lady come up to me at church, she said, I would have been coming more often if I knew that you were going to leave. I said, maybe I could have got you to stay. I said, that has nothing to do with it. I said, if I try and stay and God's told me it's time to go, I'm not going to do any good here. And she had been coming for the wrong reason. Why is it that we do not look forward to coming into God's house like we look forward to the other things in our lives? Love me. Oh, I can't wait till we get to go do so and so and so and so. I'm just so looking forward to that. Why is it we can't wait to get into God's house so much that we're going to have somebody to come with us? Amen. See, we're living in a new phase of life right now. I don't know what we can call it, but I've done come to the conclusion that we have a bunch of pajama Christians now. See, the church is provided through Facebook and other things, putting a message out. Everybody gets comfortable in their pajamas, sitting on the couch watching church, and they don't want to come back into God's house. God's word says, fail not to assemble yourselves together. Amen. Love me. And as they were walking by and looking... And God told him, says, you living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. 
Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. I had to digest this before y'all got it. What have we been doing to advance God's kingdom? Well, preacher, you know, this, this, this COVID stuff and all this and all that and all that, we can make excuses all day long. I've done it. But we can't come to church, but we go to Walmart. You say, why are you even talking about We're here. What I'm saying is get prepared because when you go out and start inviting people, they're going to give you every excuse. They're going to give you every excuse. And as they, God gave them the command, says, you take, you build your houses, but you leave mine in ruins. This is what the Lord Almighty said, give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. So how does God look at us today? Is he honored in what we do? This particular situation was to go up and bring down timbers and to build so God could be honored. But how about us? What are we building? What are we doing that God receives honor through our lives? Love me. What do we do each day? What do we get excited about? Then God says this, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a run, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops, I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains and the grain and the new wine and the oil and whatever the ground produces on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands. He goes on even to say, the money you earn there's holes in your pockets where it just falls away from you. You see, I've been on both sides of this. I've been on the side where I was doing what I was supposed to be doing for God, and it seemed like the blessings just flowed down. The blessings came. Yes, even the red lights turned green when I was going down the road, and God's blessings was there. And I've been on the side where it looked like it was miserable every day. And I'm not getting on to you this morning. I'm just stating facts. This is in God's word, but I'm looking at it in our present condition today. We can owe me and owe my all we want to or we can get to work. I'm telling you now, we are living in a time that's getting precious because there's not much of it left. We're living in a time where God's word is going to have to be declared because there's not much time left to declare it. And we're living in times when Jesus is fixing to step out in the clouds and going to call us away. And we're not going to have no more time to declare him upon this earth for who he is. So what are you doing? What am I doing to honor God? What are we doing? Are we, are we living off the foundation that's been laid through Jesus Christ? Or are we looking back and saying, well, you know, because of everything going on, we just can't quite accommodate everything today. And you know what? When, it, when I get a call, so-and-so is going to the hospital and you can't go with them. 
That hurts. Someone's going to be having surgery. You can't go because right now, if they even let your spouse in with you, they're doing good. And that's because of what's going on. But the other part of it is, are we going to buckle down under it or are we going to step up and get above it? What are we doing to bring honor to God? In Matthew 6 and 33 it says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Those who follow Christ are urged to seek above all else God's kingdom and His righteousness. The word seek here implies being continually absorbed in the search for something or making a strenuous and diligent effort to obtain something. I was watching one of my cowboy shows, and there's an old prospector found some gold somebody had left there, hidden in a cave. And he came back and told one person. And then the plot was on to get the gold away from the old prospector. Man, if we held Jesus as precious as we do some of this material stuff, we'd be whispering about Jesus to somebody and letting them be plotting on how they're going to get my Jesus. See, he's not in a sack. He's not in a box. He doesn't have a golden color to him that, that catches our eye when the sun gleams off of it. And I guess it's hard for people to understand when they can't comprehend something they haven't seen. But let me tell you something. I felt my Jesus. I've seen my Jesus and what's went on around me in my life. And I'm here to tell you this morning. You can call it a consequence. You can say, well, that just happened. Let me tell you, I know God preordains things to happen in our lives. And he lays it out. Now you can keep fooling yourself if you want to. But there's someone, something higher than we are that created everything. This world just didn't boom and blow up. You know, there's people still believe the world's flat. Y'all laugh. I run into a guy over to credit union that talked to me for 15 minutes about the world being flat. What does that got to do with this? People will believe anything. But they won't believe Jesus. Amen. What are we doing to honor God? Very simple question with a very complex answer. We can sit here and we can work within this house, but until we go outside the walls, we're not doing what God has ordained this church to do. No church is doing what it's supposed to do unless it goes outside the walls. So this morning, you may be saying, this is Old Testament. This is something that happened so many years ago. Let me tell you something. We can look at it and we can walk right along beside it. The foundation's been laid. We are the temple of God. The temple has been built. Isn't it wonderful when God took and allowed that curtain to be rent, that temple to be destroyed, that he put that innermost sanctuary, sanctification of holy of holies within us. And now we can go into the very presence of God where only one man could do that before. That's how much God thinks of each and every one of you.
That's how much God loves each and every one of us. So what are we doing to honor God? Each of us has to answer that question on our own. But then, what are we doing as a church to bring that honor to Him? What are we doing in our daily walk and in our daily lives? Sure, there's going to be some Samaritans in our lives. They're going to come in and they're going to try to disrupt. They're going to come in and they're going to try to tell you that you're a miss, miss or Mr. Holier than thou. But I'm going to tell you this, you do not change God's standards, you live by God's standards. You do not adopt the ways of the world, you adopt the one who says you're not an orphan and has taken you and grafted you into his vine. That is God himself. And I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's worth saving. When someone is adopted, they are chosen. When you have a child, you get the one God sends you. But when someone adopts someone, they choose that person. God has adopted everyone in here. Because we were of the world, but we became one of His. And He took us in. To the point to where we are now heirs to His inheritance. I think sometimes we get too caught up in the retirement of this world and don't look at the retirement that is to come. We get too caught up in the material things and not the glorious things. Well, I've stepped on your toes enough this morning. But just know this. I love you and God loves you. He wants the best for you. And if you want to see the very windows of heaven open up and blessings flow out, let it start in your house. Let it start there by you being honored because God honors you. And we don't do the things that we do for God to receive the honor but we do it because of obedience and because we love Him. Yes, He could have made us where we would have just been obedient, never would have questioned and went on, but what kind of love is that? Every now and then when I let Nick out of his house after work, I go in with him and they've got a little dog named Izzy. Well, Izzy hears me come in, Nick go let her out, she runs by Nick and comes to me because she knows I'm fixing to give her a treat. I know where they're at. And Nick say, well, just run on by me and don't even stop. I go to the jar and she knows the routine. She runs into the living room, she comes, she runs up on top of the ottoman, gets in the chair and sits there looking at me waiting. And she knows she's going to get two. I'll give her one. She'll run down to the floor and lay it down and come back to get the second one. Once she gets the second one and lays it down, then she knows she's going to eat it. And I sit down and wait where she comes over there, then I pet her. See, that's the way we ought to be. We ought to run by the world and get to God. He don't have treats, but he has blessings that is beyond compare. And he wants the best for us. He wants the very best that we can ever have. This morning as Michael comes and, and plays, boy, I enjoyed saying that, Brother Michael. And I appreciate you so much. I just want to ask you this. If there's anything that you need this morning, if you need praying for, if you need us to lay hands on you, anoint you with oil for any reason, or maybe you just want to come down here and spend some time with God and, and tell Him, say, God, put within my heart and instill in me 
how I can honor you. You know, it could be as simple as taking your word. Now, let me tell you something. I'll fix probably get some of you in trouble. Taking your word and laying it down there at your workplace. I never will forget, I, I was doing a job down in Riverside, and I went into the building inspector, never had seen the man before in my life. But when I walked in, his Bible was sitting on his desk. I said, I'm going to like this guy. And he had a sign up on the wall that said, arguing with the building inspector is like wrestling with a pig in the mud. After a while, you understand that he enjoys it. Sat down, we talked about what I had to come in, sat down and talk to him about. Then we talked about Jesus after that. And he would start showing up on the job. He said, you mind if we I hang out here a little while? I said, I don't get cussed when I come over here. And he'd hang out and talk a little while and then one day he come, he said, hey, would you ride down with me to this other job and look at something with me? I went down and we got to talk. All started because he had his Bible sitting on his desk. Maybe there's a relationship waiting just because you show yourself to be a Christian in the workplace, around family, around friends. Whatever the situation God puts you in. But God is just waiting. Waiting to use each and every one of us to the fullest. If we will ju just show the world who He is. Who He is. When I was in Talladega pastoring Coach Dupree who was my football coach at Welburn attended church air for the last few years I was there. Now when he was a coach, he wasn't saved. So I knew two Ed Dupree's. But then I knew Brother Ed when I was pastoring. And he would go into Burger King, that was his normal place to go, and the first thing he'd do was set his Bible down on the table where he was going to eat at. Go get his food and come back and sit down. And I'm going to tell you what. He would share Jesus with a fence post if it sat still and let him. That's just who he was. I've seen my brother-in-law when he was at Hardy's. Had his Bible sitting on the table when a guy come up and started questioning him. He followed him out into the parking lot and there in the parking lot they knelt and he accepted Jesus. The guy that come up because he seen a Bible sitting on the table. Now then, I can't put the Bible at my workplace because they forbid it. What's in here? Put God's word there, it goes with you everywhere. It's there. It's made available to you through the Holy Spirit. You can come up with whatever excuse you want, but God's going to shoot it down. Because He's going to give you what you need to witness. And He's going to give you what, he, what you need to bring Him honor and glory if we'll just do it. So this morning as Michael plays... I've done wandered down too many paths this morning, but I'm going to ask you to stand. If you'd like to come to these altars, these altars are open. They're never closed. They're open any time of the service. I don't care what's going on. You feel free to be here. Come down this morning. If you need prayer, would you come down this morning for whatever reason? Or maybe you want to bring your family down this morning and dedicate them to God. Because you're fixing to work as a family unit to start bringing honor and glory to God. How about that? Would you come?